Hey there, everybody. How you doing today? It is so great to have you here on our workshop. Um, my name is Joanne Gwynn. I am the Chief Development Officer of AST. Power to Save is an AST initiative dedicated to increasing public awareness about the importance of transplant research, organ donation, and advocating for transplant health. Today's workshop is Healthy Living with a Transplant. Um, and we're so grateful for um, the support that we've gotten with our Veloxis um, Pharmaceuticals. I would like to introduce our presenters today, um, Dr. Bo Kelly. Um, he is the Surgical Director and Transplant Surgeon of DCI Donor Services, and he is also an ASD board member. And Dr. Aruna Supramanian. All right. <laughs> she is a Transplant ID um, Chief at Stanford Health. So if you could just give a warm welcome to Dr. Bo and Dr. Aruna for today's workshop. It's a great pleasure to be here and speaking with you because, you know, we really think this is such an important topic, right? Healthy living with a transplant. And how can you, you do everything right and, and trying to, you know, understand what are the little nitty gritties of what more can I do, you know, really trying to keep all your meds straight, doing so many things with your families and, um, and just hats off to all of our uh, patients and, and our organ donors and recipients for everything you do. So this is, you know, transplantation really should be a fresh start, but are there restrictions? You know, we really shouldn't have to live in a bubble, right? So what can you do that'll be safe? And how do you keep yourself safe? So we thought we'd start with food safety because that's a big question, right? There's so many foodborne illnesses uh, that come with different foods. Do you have to give up raw and rare meats, cheeses, sushi, cold cuts? And the way I like to present it is really there's always two options. You know, there's always options. Is, is it you, there may be a higher risk option and a lower risk option. It doesn't mean you always do exactly, you know, you stick to only one column, but you kind of, you have to see where are you in your immunosuppression. Are you, it's working, are you, are you in the first three to six months after transplant? Have you had rejection and your level of immunosuppression is high? Have you had other infections so your immune system is, is low at this point? So that's when you have to be extra careful and pick the lower risk option. So that, this, is, this is the way I like to see it. So there are foods to avoid in general. Does it mean 100%? No. There's, and there's foods that are safer. So I like to see them as what's safer and what's not as safe, right? So raw undercooked meat and poultry um, is, is uh, not as safe as things that are cooked well unpasteurized or raw milk, queso fresco, those types of things as well are, are um, you know, less safe than pasteurized milk. Raw or undercooked eggs then co are, are less safe than cooked eggs with a firm yolk. When you get fresh produce, wash it well. Things that can be peeled are always safer than others. And, um, you know, so, so that that's always a, a good rule of thumb, really, to try to wash the, the produce. I had a mentor, Dr. John Bartlett at Hopkins, who used to say he couldn't eat raspberries because you just can't wash raspberries. How do you wash raspberries? He'd walk around. And we, um, true enough, you can get cryptosporidium from raspberries. So, And then on the, on the other side, going on with that, the soft cheese is made from unpasteurized milk. So sometimes, you know, they, they are, you have to just ask, is this pasteurized or not? And a lot of times, sauces and things that you think might not be pasteurized are often the prepackaged ones are pasteurized. So, um, and then cold hot dogs and deli meats. This one I had a, um, a co-surgeon where I went a long time ago when I was giving this talk 10 to 15 years ago. He was like, oh my God, I cannot warm up deli meats to 165 degrees. Who's going to eat that? But, I, you know, the, this is where you think, okay, this is safer than the other. Can you, are you going to do it 100% of the time? Maybe not. But especially when you're more immunosuppressed, then take extra caution. 
and then raw sprouts. People don't really think it through when they're going through the salad bars. You know, these that can be very dangerous, especially those raw um, sprouts are, are the ones that can be um, more, you know, uh, th th they're more risky than cooked uh, beans and sprouts. So please come in. You can join us. And then water safety. You know, especially people who live in, in the country or who have wells, you have to think this through. So there are good filters with very small, less than one micron um, pores. We have to think about tap water is generally safe, but sometimes you'll get um, you know, notices from your county or city that really need to boil the water. Of course, bottled water in general is, is, is uh, safe, but really um, you, you don't need to always use it. If you bring the water, it should be brought to a rolling boil for at least a minute. If you live at a high altitude, it should be at least three minutes. And then the other thing, especially for kids, when they're swimming, you have to be careful they don't swallow the water. When, they're, when you go um, hiking or camping, you know, not, not drinking directly from lakes and streams because those can really have fecal materials. And it's all natural from, uh, uh, from the animals and from other people. So you just have to be a little bit more careful in those settings. And then this is always, this comes up. I love my pet. Can I keep them? And this is really, you know, there's pluses and minuses. There have been studies that show that pets bring such joy to people. And you can't just, we, you know, I've had people make blanket statements, oh, get rid of all pets. But that's, you know, that's not fair because there's a joy that, that animals bring to our lives. So we just have to be a little more careful and just think it through. So, uh, yeah, this is pet health is important as well. Keep the pets up to date, but birds, especially, you know, can be quite. Um, uh, get, you can get a lot of different infections from them. So that I I recommend trying to um, not have birds, or you know, if you're not so attached, that would be be better to get you know, not have birds and reptiles and amphibians. These are things that can give you salmonella. The reptiles. I had a. a a patient who was part of Reptile Rescue of Maryland when I was in at Hopkins, and, and he he did he, he came in several times with salmonella. So it, it's really um, a, a uh, an issue that uh, and this is there's no HIPAA violation. This was 15, 20 years ago. So um, and this uh, with uh, rodents, they carry LCMV, a type of virus. So these are things you have to be careful of. Um, and uh, and then there's more. I don't know. I I, I don't know. Uh, I can't even relate to having a tarantula or a spider or something as a pet. Get rid of that. <laughs> <laughs> For other reasons. Zero <laughs> yeah. So, but cats, especially the kitty litter, it, you know, that is where you can get a lot of infections from. So having a family member, you know, have somebody else change the kitty litter. A lot of people don't mind giving that job to someone else. So that's a better job. Baby cats, baby kittens are, are more likely to carry infections. And then dogs, you can get infections from dog bites or even without a dog bite. But, um, you know, as long as your dog is up to date with their health care, then I, I feel like it's, it's worth having pets if, you're, if, if they're really special to you. And then do, do I have to give up gardening? So there are infection risks, especially in, in California and in Arizona. We have coccidioides coming from the soil. It's a type of fungus that you can breathe in. And, and we, we test for this. Um, and it, you can get uh, different types of fungi from the soil, especially. Um, but the, and, and you can get a type of, it's an infection called sporotrichosis from getting uh, a thorn when you're doing rose gardening, rose bushes. So I say you don't have to give up gardening. I, I recommend not being there in the soil during that highest risk period, during the first three months of your uh, after transplant, you know, if, if you, as I said, if you're uh, having rejection and you're on higher doses of immunosuppression, that's when you should be extra careful. But gardening also brings joy. So if you're going to do it, then wear gloves and, and try to cover your skin. Often 
we, we give you medicines that um, you're, you have higher risk of sunburn and other sun-related uh, sun skin problems. So better to have skin coverage, even loose-fitting, um, you know, light-colored clothes. Masks would be important if you're in a place where there's a lot of this type of dust and, and things coming up that you can, you can breathe in. And then if you have a lot of mosquitoes, if you're in a humid area, then make sure you have mosquito repellent. We do see infections from mosquito bites. And then if you have a lot of brush around, then uh, tick checks. Make sure you, you do a full body check and remove any ticks if they're attached because the longer they stay attached, the more likely they're gonna give you an infection. So there are a variety of different infections we can get from that are related to gardening or hiking and things like that. And you can do them, but do it in a little bit more safe way with this type of protection. And then this does come up, it comes up um, often here in California, but I'm sure it comes up in other places too. Uh, I want to relax. What about alcohol or marijuana? It's legal in my state. Can I partake? And there's not a lot of data on safety, and there might be risks. So I would say, you know, better to avoid, or, or at least, you know, do it in, in small amounts, because mental impairment, drug interactions, we worry about kidney injury, um, and then, of course, with alcohol, liver injury, now that we've got hepatitis C, um, a good treatment for hepatitis C, unfortunately, alcohol-related um, liver disease is such a big reason for liver transplant, so we have to be careful. Then with marijuana, um, especially abnormal heart rhythms can be seen, and then if you're smoking it, you can breathe in um, aspergillus, which is a type of mold, a fungal infection. So the thought is, is that the edible types are a little bit less risky if, if you feel that that's something you want to do. But this is something to talk to the transplant team, and they're, help, they're there to help you with these decisions. So it shouldn't be that we can't even talk about these things. You know, these aren't 100%. We need, to, we need to work with folks and really think things through and see what's safer than others. And then, of course, now that uh, I know through the pandemic, we couldn't even think about this, but now we're starting to think about okay, I'm, I'm so cooped up, how do I, when can I travel, can I travel? And, and the restrictions in general on travel are few actually. You can travel after a transplant, but you really have to think it through ahead of time, review the itinerary with your transplant team before booking the travel. Often there are travel clinics in, in your transplant center, and we have one where in fact the physician who runs the travel clinic actually is a transplant ID physician, so he does both. And, and so a lot of times you can get that expertise on, okay, my immune system isn't perfect, what do I need to travel safely? And then some precautions may be required. It's usually based on the specific location you're going to. CDC has a very nice website with each location and what type of vaccines you need and what type of precautions. And then keep your medications in your carry-on. That's an important one. But then sometimes you need a doctor's list. Um, and I've written letters for patients when they've had to take liquid medications in their carry-ons and so all of that. But that needs to be thought through. You know, if you're leaving tomorrow, you're not gonna be able to get a letter today. So all of this has to be planned out. Um, and then have a plan for care if you get sick. I've had patients where they're, you know, they're going to India and I might know somebody there who, who um, runs a, a transplant clinic. And, and you know, it, if, you, if you know that ahead of time, you can sort of plan, what would I do? Thankfully, they haven't had needed to use it, but it's always good to have a plan. Anything you wanna, please jump in if there's anything I leave out. And uh, travel to the developing world the things that people say are boil it, cook it, peel it, or forget it. <laughs> so if you can't do any of those, then, then don't, you know, the street foods and all, even with a normal immune system, 
can can give you the runs, you know. So I I, I wouldn't recommend it. I uh, recently had <laughs> traveler's diarrhea. Maybe this is TMI, but but it's it's not a fun uh, thing even with it, with a normal immune system. And so bottled water, you know, water can get into your drinks very surreptitiously. You don't even realize. Like ice can be just made with tap water and can give you uh, traveler's diarrhea if you're not careful. So you have to really try to remember to get, um, you know, drinks that are in bottles and, and, and things that, or something that's piping hot, like tea or coffee or something. And then have a plan for traveler's diarrhea. I usually send my patients with Cipro or whatever it is that, that they might need, or have a place where you can get it, know a place nearby that, where you can be evaluated. And then things, of course, when you're traveling, sunscreen and then DEET or, or some sort of mosquito protection, that's all important. And then vaccination before, trans, before travel. You should tr you know, plan to visit the travel clinic or, or your vaccine clinic several weeks, if not a month or two before you travel so you can get up to date on those vaccines that you need. Yeah, ice is, a, is something really you have to watch out for. And then some people say, oh, well, I'm from there. I'm going home. You know, well, you were there maybe 30 years ago. And the, the, your immune system isn't ready to fight those things anymore. So it, it doesn't mean, just because you're going home doesn't mean you, you, um, you know, that it's totally safe. And CDC.gov has very good advice on these things. So vaccines. Vaccines are just... Um, you know, have helped people so much. I know they, during COVID, there was a lot of um, back and forth, what, what, you know, some misinformation, some fear, some, some worry about side effects, but really vaccines save uh, 42,000 lives every year in the U.S. alone. And we all don't, don't think twice about wearing seat belts, you know, and, and these are so much more effective. So, but they get a bad rap. You know, some of these, some of these uh, diseases we used to see quite frequently, mumps, measles, rubella, influenza, whooping cough, pneumonia, polio, hepatitis, chicken pox, tetanus, diphtheria, meningitis. We have vaccines for all of these and HPV. So there are all things to think about we can try to prevent, it. some of the vaccines aren't 100%. I know people say, oh, I got the flu anyway. But really, rates are so much lower when you get vaccinated, and complications are so much lower. So, And some of those diseases are completely gone. So it, it's really unbelievable. And vaccines help protect both you and your family. So this is something we, we have pre-transplant evaluation clinics where we really try to think through what have people been exposed to? Are they up to date on their vaccines? You know, I know people feel like they're jumping through all these hoops to get to the transplant. Oh, I have to do the echo. I have to do the cath. I have to do this and that. And, but what can I, you know, so they forget about this, but vaccines are so important before the transplant. So if you know somebody who's going through that process, please remind them that this is, this is equally important to seeing a cardiologist or whatever, you know, whatever else you have to do pre-transplant. And so and not, it's not just for children, it's for adults too, the, you know, checking the records, make sure you, you know what, to, what you've received. And the earlier you can get it before you have end stage organ failure, if we can give the, trans, give the vaccines before that, then you're even more likely to respond. So, and then if you need um, vaccines after transplant, usually we say at three to six months, you might start to respond to some vaccines. So we usually wait three to six months, except for the flu, you, you can give it even a month after the transplant. We have to avoid live vaccines. There are some um, exceptions you can talk to your doc about, but in general, we say avoid live vaccines and continue to update the standard ones, flu, pneumonia, tetanus, and then in certain um, folks, hepatitis and meningitis, and of course now COVID vaccines. So, uh, and don't forget to make sure that your household is up to date on vaccines. It was, 
sad during uh, the COVID um, pandemic. I, you know, I, I see, I would see, sometimes I'd see family members who would just give their lives. They would do everything for their, um, you know, family member who, uh, who had a transplant, but then they didn't always get vaccinated. And that's the simplest thing I, I think that you could do. You know, it's easier than some of the other things that people are willing to do for their family members. So. And we all know now we're old hat at COVID-19 prevention, indoor. Still, I think if you're cl close together um, and there's high rates, then masks definitely help. The, the KN95s especially, um, and good ventilation, um, keeping windows open when you can, let, letting there be um, cross ventilation. If you're going on planes, I would still recommend wearing masks, even though Flying down here, I saw very few masks on planes. And then, of course, keeping up to date with all your COVID-19 vaccines and boosters. This fall, we should be getting a variant-specific vaccine, so you might need another booster at that time. If you do get um, COVID, there's non-clonal antibody treatments if you get it early, but there's also a prevention. I don't know if people have heard of Evusheld. A lot of centers are giving Evusheld, which is a monoclonal antibody you can get even if you didn't respond to the vaccine, this is the same type of antibody that you can be given to give you some protection against COVID. So there are strategies you can have to prevent COVID-19 other than vaccines, which are the antibodies. Um, and, and it's very similar to what your own body would produce if, if you had you know, a very robust immune system. And then of course, if you do get COVID-19, testing early and then getting treatment early uh, with either monoclonals or we give IV remdesivir and then people are getting Paxlovid left and right which is which is good if if you need it but there are very um, profound drug interactions so you really should talk to your physician before taking Paxlovid because your TACRO or your cyclosporin level could go through the roof. So you just really need to think these through before you um, take it on your own. Because now I think it's much easier to get. And then, of course, if it's not something, it's something else, right? Now, where did monkeypox come from? But we are now seeing monkeypox um, in, in our clinic. And, uh, and it thankfully seems to be uh, more difficult to spread than COVID-19 in that it's very close contact. That's why we're seeing it in, um, in sexual partners, but it's really just close contact that uh, allows it to spread. You can get it from infected materials as well, so bedding and, and other things that um, people are using. So th that's something to be careful of. And then there are vaccines for this. Uh, the vaccine that you can give for immunocompromised patients is a live virus, but it doesn't replicate. It doesn't make more copies of itself. So it appears to be safe in transplant patients. We, there aren't real studies, though, yet in that. But we, you could consider getting that if, if you were exposed. And then there is a treatment for it, too. Um, so uh, it's, it's also limited in, in supply, but, but our clinics are giving the treatment as well. So that's the latest scare, and uh, of course, it just uh, it just keeps us on our toes. But I think that it's just so wonderful to see how much everybody's able to do. The Transplant Games of America has just been so such a lovely feeling that everybody's able to get out and and you know do much better than than you know I think they even dreamed. So it's it's just a, a wonderful thing, and and I think you're all living very healthy lives. But just it's good to keep these pointers in the back of your mind. And I'll hand the mic over now. Yeah, okay. excellent. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> Only an infectious disease physician can speak with such joy and hope <laughs> about monkeypox <laughs> and then pass it to me. If you, it, I, I have to echo Dr. Dr. Subramanian's uh, energy and, and just sheer joy to be here. It, it's a tremendous honor to be here. Um, uh, you know, we, we give lots of talks that are typically of a scientific nature. Um, so to be here as a transplant surgeon, full disclosure, I'm a pediatric and adult transplant surgeon, don't judge me. Um, 
to be here to actually talk about healthy living on the other side of that big operation is is the reason for the season. Like that, that's what I live for. So it's, it's so thank you so much for allowing me to come and talk to you. If you're here attending this session um, or listening to the recording of this session, I'm going to venture to guess that you are probably one of a couple of different flavors of folk. You're, you're probably a transplant recipient who's looking to figure out how to live your best life. I applaud that. You are either on the transplant wait list and trying to figure out what that light at the end of the tunnel really looks like. Is that a train or is that actually sunshine? Or you're in that last category of people which is probably a support person of some type who's trying to figure out how to creatively motivate your you know, household partner. Um, all of which is great. I'm, I'm here for all of it. So um, I, I will move off of this slide. That, that just... <laughs> uh, uh, um, so yeah, so here we go. Um, I, I will say that um, activity. So activity after a transplant. And you're talking to, again, the transplant surgeon who's done all this intricate, delicate work inside of you. And there's the part of me that wants you to live and go and venture. And there's the other part of me that doesn't want you to mess up this thing I just did. <laughs> Selfish as that may sound. Um, I will tell you that, um, you, know, you know, the disclaimer here is always default to your transplant centers. And I don't want you to think that that's, you know, mailing it in or, you know, some kind of lame excuse for not wanting to specifically answer the question. But ideally, you're all unique. Um, you all have very special circumstances for the disease that brought you to transplant. Um, you have very unique uh, circumstances that may have been in and around your transplant. You may be on specific medications that are maybe a little bit outside of the norm for, for some patients. We like to throw out lots of standards and guidelines and, and things that we think are best for everybody, but we all realize how, how silly that may sound at certain times because people have certain circumstances. You may be on blood thinners. You may be on various types of blood pressure medications. You may be on other medications that control your blood sugar. There's there just so many varieties and flavors of folk that, that it really just doesn't make sense for us to give you sort of one real focused thing. But the, but the point of our discussions here are really to try to provide some guardrails for some of the things that we feel are at least um, good recommendations for sensible living. Let's call it that. Um, I used to have a patient, um, and, I, and I'll tell you this as a, as a, conf a full confession. She came to me as a young girl. Um, I'd done her transplant, and she wanted to mountain climb, and she wanted to do all these crazy adventurous things, and I would always say, no, 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 no. And every year, she would send me a picture of her doing something crazy, um, or what I would consider to be crazy. But after about the 10th year of her doing this, I realized that maybe my, my recommendations were not so sound. So I, I, I say all this to say that Activity is great. Activity in moderation, um, sort of right up to that point where, we're, where it's not injurious, is great. I can't make great recommendations for all the various sports that, that, that can be performed. I would uh, graciously submit that I would rather that you not be an MMA fighter or you know, a, a demolition expert or, you know, any of those types of sports that, that are dangerous to even folks who haven't had transplants. Um, but again, I, I think the sensible sort of approach to this is, is really going to be contingent on your level of fitness, your level of uh, sort of commitment um, to these various sports. For kids, I do make recommendations about contact sports, particularly early on if their incisions aren't quite closed if patients have hernias, if um, there are some limitations um, with some of the cardiac and, and lung transplant recipients as far as their um, reserve. So those would be the sort of general recommendations I'd make to you. Uh, in, in Buddhism, we say that everybody's unique with each new breath. I, I think that, that Buddha may have had a lung transplant, but, but that's, you know, that's sort of the general idea that we would like to throw out to you. You're all unique. 
So please refer to and defer to your transplant teams to make sure that they're just aware of the, of the activities that you're interested in. Are you having pain? Well, you know, I can tell you every middle-aged person in here has probably had back pain, ankle pain, hip pain, knee pain. It doesn't mean you have osteoporosis, but it does mean that it's something you may have to track. Patients who are on steroids, patients who are on various types of immunosuppressions, uh, uh, medications, it changes the metabolism of your bone health. Um, and so with that, it's imperative to track those types of things. Many transplant uh, patients, or I'm sorry, patients who are listed for transplant get uh, bone metabolism studies just to make sure that your, your bone health is somewhat within a healthy range prior to subjecting you to, uh, to the variety of, of medications that may alter that, um, that metabolism. So supplements are great. Um, supplements will certainly help. Uh, please talk to your physicians, particularly if you have a primary care physician that's doing a lot of your, your managed care uh, about bone metabolism and about following um, that with uh, bone uh, densitometry studies. Um, it's a good thing to track, uh, particularly as we get older. Woo, we are here in Southern California, and you are loving that sun, right? No, you're not. You're that person out there in that big sombrero and the caked on sunscreen, because that's where you live, right? The number one cause of cancer after a transplant is skin cancer. Let me say that again for you. The number one cause of common cancer after a transplant is skin cancer. Take care of yourself. Take care to protect. Um, I love the sun. I love the fun. I do not love the skin cancer. So all of the precautions that are listed here are in your best interest um, to avoid that complication. In the event that you develop a mole that's new, um, I would have yourself and or another person sort of track that. It's easy to take pictures. It's easy to forward those pictures to your transplant center just so folks know um, that you may have these irregularities um, that need to be followed, tracked, and potentially um, biopsied at some point. Um, <laughs> I chuckle about this slide. Um, it, it says here that, that, that all water is, is not equal. That is very true. Um, I'm reminded of this, this commercial, this old commercial for filtered water um, where there's a guy talking about the mountain spring water in the foreground and in the background is the big black bear who's taking a squat in the, <laughs> in the stream. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's a good image to keep in mind, okay, as you're <laughs> swimming and rec recreating, if you will, in certain types of bodies of water, remember that there are certain animals that like to do their business there. So. That's not an environment that's, that's sort of conducive and healthy to uh, an immunosuppressed individual. So streams, uh, lakes that, that, that don't have moving water are, are probably not the greatest idea uh, for immunosuppressed patients. I would tell you, if you have small children who like to rip off their diapers in the swim pool, that that too can be a bit of a challenging environment. It, it can be pH controlled and chlorine controlled, but again, precaution is, is uh, imperative in those areas. Probably your best and only safest option would be out in the middle of the ocean where there's just so much water that you can't really get too damaged by that. But again, uh, as Dr. Subramanian mentioned, uh, ingesting any of these types of waters um, could be potentially dangerous and should probably be avoided. All right, so the support people are all leaning forward now because they want to know about this weight gain thing. Um, unfortunately, and fortunately, much of the metabolism that's involved uh, with the medications at post-transplant can lead to some forms of water retention and some forms of weight gain. And a lot of that has to do with changes in metabolism. It also has, has um, something to do with changes in levels of activity in and around the time of transplant. Um, some of that stuff is actually avoidable. Avoidable with increased exercise regimens in, and uh, differences in, in choices for foods. Um, not listed here is, is probably the most um, injurious, which would be the ingestion of high rates of carbohydrates. High rates of carbohydrates in patients who have um, steroid regimens 
can lead, as you all know, I'm sure, to spikes in blood sugar and changes in, in sort of energy levels um, and can lead to uh, increased weight gain. It's a big problem in kids who get transplant. It's a big problem in adults who get transplant. The best thing I can tell you is to make um, good, healthy uh, food choices, mix it up a little bit, figure out what tastes good but doesn't uh, lead to uh, increased weight. Um, smaller amounts more times a day actually has, has been proven to have some benefit in uh, weight management. Dietary supplements can be problematic only because uh, the contents of some of these um, supplements is not fully known and not fully sort of FDA approved in combination with a lot of the medications that are taken post-transplant. That's probably the, the most generic, safe way I can say it. Um, so it, it, it's really to be... Um, another one of these categories where I would say it's safe to uh, talk to your transplant programs about your sort of interest and concern and need for supplements. Many of the supplements can be um, either acquired through diets, changes in diets, multivitamins, other, other pathways that don't necessarily involve the potential risk of, of the unknown. Um, probiotics actually can be, I, I mean, in some of our intestine transplant patients, we actually prescribe probiotics um, to help fortify their intestines. But I would say it is, again, one of those categories of, of supplement and medication that, that probably should be avoided. Um, much of that can be attained through other sort of dietary choices. Can I have a baby? All right. Well, I have a, a, a lots of pediatric patients who are now adults who are now moving into this time period where they're starting to have these questions and concerns and they want to ask me all these things and of course I don't want to answer them the same way I don't want to answer them with my own children. Um, the, um, you know, I had a patient who's now in her late 20s, early 30s and she said, why didn't you tell me that at the time of my transplant that I wouldn't be able to have children later. And I said, well, you were seven, so I didn't think it was probably the time to talk about the birds and the bees. But um, the, the simple answer is I, I'm not here to poo-poo um, <laughs> a, 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 a sexual life. I'm not here to poo-poo um, planned uh, family planning. But I do think it's one of those um, life choices that has to be entered into very carefully. Um, I would encourage many, uh, all young women who are getting transplants to engage in, in birth control at the right time, simply because fluctuations in hormone levels, depending on how many, um, how much immunosuppression a patient may, on, may be on, can really increase the risk of having um, birth defects and actual, actually problematic um, pregnancies. So uh, the, the short answer is this is, a, this is not even just a question for your transplant team. This is a, pay, this is a question to have with your transplant team, your family, um, counsel, um, family counseling, plant counseling, an OB-GYN, high-risk person, all in the same room, all in the same conversation to make sure that if that's the direction that it's being um, engaged with uh, sort of full knowledge of the risks. I think a medical uh, alert bracelet is a good idea, and I've seen a couple of scenarios where, that, where it's actually played out to be very beneficial for um, patients who either are incapacitated for whatever reason, can't fully vouch for themselves, and even during the, the time or um, during the pandemic period, I, I've been on a couple of problematic flights where a person could identify themselves as immunosuppressed and actually take themselves out of a potentially bad uh, exposure situation. So it's, it's, not, um, it's not a cross to bear. You're not being marked for um, you know, anything other than potential sort of help and benefit. So I, I think that it's a good idea. It doesn't have to include too much um, personal information if that's a concern. Obviously, there's lots of concerns about, about safety and and uh, identity um, sort of retention. So I, I think that it's, in general, a good idea. 
living with others, so you can't use that transplant as an excuse to divorce your family. Uh, <laughs> they're the ones that are going to help take care of you. Um, so having children in the home, particularly when the, one of the transplant recipients may be the child, you may have multiple children, um, the whole house now has to kind of change its environment and has to sort of change the way that we're going to roll. Um, and what that means is a lot of hygiene, a lot of planning, a lot of, you know, if the pandemic taught us anything, we're, we're kind of dirty folks. So we need to make sure that we uh, do all that's necessary to sort of minimize, I can't say you, you, you can eliminate it, but you can certainly minimize um, the risk of exposure within, within your own home. Um, does that mean that everybody has to now live like they're a transplant recipient? Not exactly, but, but we definitely want to make choices about who, you know, what type of activities our friends are engaged in, what type of exposure the other children may have. Um, you know, the pandemic was really problematic when you have a child who's been in a classroom that's now been exposed to somebody in that classroom. We have multiple kids, and now what are we sending the kids to school? Are we keeping them at home? What are we doing? Um, so I think some of that at least helped us um, try to figure out the best ways in which uh, we could manage multi-child homes. So the best, the best course of action is, is protection, obviously, and uh, planned hygiene. Uh, children can go to, to, to school and daycare. Um, most children who've received transplants, there's a period of time where their immunosuppression is probably at its highest after the transplant. That's a period in which, and it's true for adults as well, where we try to minimize risks and exposure because the immune, the immune system is so suppressed. And so during that first sort of four to six week period where those, those medications are, the, the, the levels of those medications are high and the immunosuppression um, has its highest impact and the immune system is the most impacted, we try to protect children from those, from those um, potentially unnecessary exposures. And during that time, we, we discourage it. After that, though, as the immune system becomes more adaptive, um, it's actually probably beneficial to, to get out into, into some of these environments, and obviously in a controlled sort of way. Um, it is good to let the school know um, that this is the new circumstance and that these are some of the precautions that would be helpful to help a child, one, not feel isolated and um, uh, you know, ostracized, if you will, um, but also be able to fully engage in activities. So, and, and as Dr. Subramanian mentioned, immune, immunization is probably the best shield and protection for, for these children in these environments. And making sure that that's a sort of prerequisite or at least a, a fundamental requirement to be in those, those situations is also helpful. Oh, man, I, I would say and I would hope that everybody here is kept fully up on their, their dental appointments. I will be the first to admit that during COVID, that was one of the things that was very challenging to keep up with. Um, if, you, if you sort of Google it um, and you look at the amount of bacteria that are in the human mouth and you compare that with the butt of a dog, yeah, guess who has more bacteria? You dirty mouth people. That's right. It's our mouths. And so oral hygiene is a huge point of, of interest for transplant recipients. So maintaining that, maintaining good gum health, um, getting rid of, of sort of bad teeth, bad situations uh, within the mouth is imperative. Um, the, the prophylaxis of um, those procedures with antibiotics is the, is the kind of the thing that we advocate, meaning you would just get a course of, a short course of antibiotics that would help you fight off any infections that might come up during the course of a dental procedure is a good idea. Again, that needs to be done sort of in concert with um, the medications that are being administered by your transplant team. Some of these antibiotics have some untoward effects that might impact your level of immunosuppression. So it's always good to keep you know, the folks that are pres prescribing those drugs in the know just on the off chance that they need to alter the levels of those, or the doses of those medications. Some of these um, drugs can also cause digestive changes. They can cause diarrhea. Again, all of those things will impact the levels of immunosuppression 
um, and it's just good to make sure that that's a, a coordinated effort with the transplant program. Eye care is, is another big one and probably one that people don't think about as much. Um, but in the early days of transplantation, CMV, cytomegalovirus, was a big problem. It's still a big problem, but one of the ways it was most commonly showing up was in people who were having vision issues. And when you looked deep in a dilated exam, you could actually see CMV retinitis. Um, and so having good eye care, having um, sort of a fastidious um, exams, all of those exams performed under dilation is a great idea because one, it can look for these types of infections and fungal infections, but it can also look for things like uncontrolled hypertension that might be related to medications. There are even some changes that are consistent with uh, cataracts and progressive glaucoma, um, as well as some features of diabetes. So a good idea to keep um, that on the, on the annual schedule for, for appointments that need to be made. Generic drugs are, are unfortunately and fortunately our future. I say unfortunately because in the generic world, it just means that there's a lots of different formulations and companies that are coming into the arena to make the various drugs that we need post-transplant. Um, fortunately, because it actually helps to control the cost of some of these medications. So it's a real fine balance between um, you know, the generics and, and the non-generics, but all in all, we just have to be aware that, that medications may change within a pharmacy, and again, that's something that just needs to be um, relayed to the transplant centers. Um, it, it's, it's the future, and there's really not, a, not any way around that. So I, I've said it a lot, but when in doubt, always uh, communicate with your transplant center. I wouldn't think of it as a, a, a communication of uh, permission but really just a communication of, of coordination of your care. And again, this is, this is a tremendous sort of place to be because if we're, if we're talking about after transplant, then hopefully we're talking about the, you know, sort of the hope in life uh, moving forward. So um, tremendous honor to talk about this. I think we have a couple more slides here. And oh, yeah, I'll let, uh, yeah. The, yeah, Dr. Subramanian was thoughtful enough to put together some, some trivia slides <laughs> yes, for you. Yes, I thought, in case people were falling asleep. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dr. Oh. Kelly. Um, so I, we just, I know you, some of you may have done the trivia session already. I don't know if these questions overlap, but just, you can yell it out if, if but in what Olympic event did li liver transplant recipient Chris Klug win a bronze medal? Was it A, snowboard cross, B, big air, C, half pipe, or D, giant parallel slalom? How many people say A? Show of hands. None? Well, is it B, big air? It's OK. It's, nobody's testing you on this. <laughs> C, half pipe. Yeah? Was it, or was it D, giant parallel slalom? Yeah, it was D, giant parallel slalom. I, this is, I, I just learned this recently. So. Oh, and um, coming soon. There's AST is developing a comprehensive survey to better understand unmet needs in transplantation. It's going to cover all organs, pediatric and adult, and this survey is expected to be released in uh, the spring of 2020. So please keep an eye out for it. We need patient participation for this, and uh, we'd benefit from linkage to patient groups for dissemination. And this data will be presented to the FDA to push for advances in immunosuppression and the inclusion of patient-reported outcome measures in the FDA pro process for transplant-related approvals. So it's going to be super important that everybody participate and really get your voice heard there. So that's just a plug that we put into this. OK, back to trivia. Now, NBA stars. What organ transplant did basketball star Alonzo Mourning receive in 2003? Was it A, kidney? OK, a lot of votes. B, liver. Couple. C, heart. Or D, lungs. So we know who the basketball fans are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it was A, it was kidney. Yes. And he, he took. There have actually been a couple of 
kidney recipients oh, yeah? who are pro basketball players. So okay. Sean Elliott was another one during that same time who had a kidney transplant. Yeah. Okay. And he actually came back. He took a season off, and then he came back yeah, along the morning yeah, and played, played. played well, too. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. You know, this, this was, the, you please feel free to <laughs> no, chime in since I don't. Ahead. Okay. <laughs> What's that? That would be against your slides to go back and play. Oh. No, no. no. <laughs> he, he said more the, the real contact. I guess basketball is contact, too. But, um, okay, and now th this, this is Oscar Robinson. Um, he had a 1960 Olympic gold in basketball. for the. Um, and so what did he call his assist of a lifetime? Was it A, the highest number of rebounds in a game, B, Co-captaining the Olympic team with Jerry West. Come on. No. Okay. C, donating his kidney to his daughter, Tia. All right. Okay. And D, receiving a kidney from his daughter, Tia. All right. Well, it was actually C, and you yeah. actually know them, right? Yeah, yeah. But I was actually fortunate enough to participate in their care. Yeah. So, I, I, so. I, I, this one I know. Yeah, so he <laughs> donated his kidney to his daughter, Tia, and that is what he thought was the biggest assist of his lifetime. He, he thought that was more important, much more important than his Olympic gold and, and all the other things that he did. So... That's it. So in general, our message is that intellectuals solve problems, but geniuses prevent them. So let's all be geniuses, and let's prevent any problems going forward, and really so everybody can live a healthy life. Do you have any questions? That, that would be this time. Yes, sir. It is. So if one has a reaction to penicillin, probably not a good idea. Absolutely not. If, if there's an allergy, there's actually um, some other medications that you can take as substitutes. Um, so again, that would be something that would definitely have to be, can you hear me okay? I'm sorry. I was moving it away because I felt like it was in my face. Um, the, um, there, there are other substitutes that you could take. Um, that would be a good prophylaxis or a good protection in those, but in those circumstances. One, one caveat I would make is though people come with, to transplant with this, I'm allergic to amoxicillin, you know, that they took it as a baby mm -hmm. and got a rash and they don't know, it really truly are they allergic? You know, sometimes if you grow out of the allergy, many people grow out of the allergy. So it, if you know you're allergic and you've been tested, then definitely stay away. But there are a good time. I didn't. We didn't include it, but if you can get an allergy consult pre-transplant, we really find that de-labeling people yeah, with sir. allergies is, is important. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Ken, can you recipient. Related question, actually, that that brought up. I've heard conflicting advice about prophylaxis for dental care uh, with amoxicillin. I, is it has it changed or is it it, more it has changed. Um, so this is, you know. I think it, it, it is center specific, but the overall recommendations are moving away from amoxicillin um, prevention. But it really, it, if, you're, if your transplant um, center is one that's still using it, then, then I would say keep, keep up with that. Yeah, and, there, and there are other medications actually that can be used as, as prophylaxis. Yeah. Way in the back. <laughs> Sure. So if you can't hear it just, just for the recording as well, the question is about CMV and, and sort of the prevalence of CMV in the general populace. And, and so if, if you just checked everybody in here or everybody who was not a transplant patient, by the time you're 70 years old, 70% 70 of people carry some level of CMV and have had some exposure to CMV. It's a, a very ubiquitous virus. Um, yeah, and yeah. so so there are different. You may carry it into the transplant, and then you can, when your immune system is low, you can reactivate it. Sometimes in the thirty percent or more who haven't been exposed, it can come through the transplant, which is also very common. It's it's just something 
good to know, and then we prevent, we use prophylaxis um, strategies afterwards. Usually for three to six months after the transplant, you, um, people might get an antiviral um, to prevent it from reactivating, but it can happen even after that. It, it, yeah. It's something that you've been exposed to, um, or most of us have been exposed to at some point during our lives, and we just carry it as kind of a latent sort of infection. It's dormant, it doesn't cause us any issues or problems, but in somebody who's immunosuppressed, it now has an ability to sort of rear itself up and cause some of the problems that are related with that, with that type of virus. Um, as Dr. Subramanian said, we give medications right at the time of transplant because that's the time when your immune system is the most suppressed to try to help keep that risk of, of damage from that virus down. Uh, we typically know before the transplant whether the recipient has carried that virus in the past. We also test organ donors for the same thing to make sure that when we put those two sort of combinations together, we're not um, inadvertently elevating the risk for the recipient. But there are medications that we give to try to keep that, that virus under in check. It's all about medication. There's nothing else. There's no way to get rid of it completely. It's no. part of the herpes family of viruses. And really, once you've had exposure to any of those viruses, they all stay latent in our system. And, and can reactivate. Um, it's just a, just, yeah. just a sleepy virus that doesn't cause any types of problems mm -hmm. unless you poke it. And, and you poke it by immunosuppressing your body and or you know, rearing it or uh, with other types of infections. <clears throat> but we are gonna be studying a CMV vaccine Ooh, in, in liver transplant recipients, actually. <laughs> so this is a plug for that. Uh, for if, you, if you're interested, some centers, a multi-center trial is gonna happen soon, and, and, uh, but it's, we're giving it to pre-transplant recipients so that to try to see if that would be a way to avoid medications after transplant. Yeah, good question. We see fever, we see lymph node swelling, um, fatigue, and uh, some cough, but not much. Um, yeah, mostly that, and then the rash, of course, and, and pain. It, the, the rash, especially if it's around you know, sensitive areas, it can be very painful. It can involve the eyes, and so people, they say not to use contact lenses if somebody's testing positive, because it can get into your eyes and, and cause a lot of pain. Yeah. Enough to worry. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm glad that you guys brought up pregnancy because it's something that I've thought about a lot. I, I haven't gotten my transplant yet, but I'm going to be on the list soon um, for a liver transplant. Mm -hmm. And of course, I have plans to have a family after. Um, but I guess I was told by my transplant center that it wouldn't be a problem at all. But it kind of sounds like it might be. So, what is, what is the percentage of people who after a transplant are able? Yeah, that, that, that is the million dollar question for, for young women who are actively sort of listed for transplant. And, and I wish I could cite a statistic. Um, the, 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 the problem with citing a statistic is that um, it's hard to predict what types of uh, problems that you'll have with your menstrual cycle post-transplant. Um, so the old adage was that you, you never wanted to sort of falsely tell somebody that they would have an ability to, to have children normally simply because it was just hard to predict what that would look like. The, the answer to your question is, is it a possibility? The answer is absolutely. Like we're, we're going through all this so that when on the other side of your transplant you are still able to do the same things that, that young women would want to do without a transplant. I would encourage you to start that conversation and planning now just so you have a really informed approach of, of what that could look like for you. Um, there could be some fertility concerns uh, for you post-transplant that could be potentially addressed with some counseling now. Um, there are just other types of family planning things that you may want to consider as far as the timing. You know, again, there's so much um, individualization of, of, of transplant circumstances. 
you know, things that can happen that just may prolong that conversation. So I think it's good to know that yes, you can you can expect to have children. I have patients who have had multiple children, um, so it's a possibility. But there, it's going to be a little bit more challenging than than sort of the average uh, situation. Yeah. Yes. Um, so just to piggyback off of that, um, one of the things that we talked about with our transplant team, like as far as how to, mm -hmm. was um, you know she'd be on a certain immunosuppressant um, you know for a while after she got transplant, but then you'd be able to switch that immunosuppressant, which is unkind to the pregnant. Exactly. For another one that is kind and is less effective, but fortunately not like the end all be all for. That, that, that is exactly the, the customization that I'm talking about. I'm sorry, I'm not being more specific about it, but there, there are v various types of immunosuppressive medication regimens that are more favorable to a more normal menstrual sort of predictable cycle. Um, in the meanwhile, I would encourage it, um, uh, birth control um, and, and the, whatever sort of flavor that they're recommending to you from your transplant center with the knowledge that that's where you're pointing after this. And so without knowing too many details about your particular situation, I, I would say that that's just gonna be an ongoing conversation. Some patients have a lot of rejection after their transplant, depending on what was their disease etiology that really alters the course of how much immunosuppressive medications they need. And that really sets the tone and, and, and impacts your ability to have a normal sort of fertility cycle that would promote a healthy pregnancy. A lot of it isn't so much the getting pregnant, it's the retaining the pregnancy after, after becoming pregnant. So just making sure that you're prepared for that is I think the most, probably the safest thing you can do. Often there is an OBGYN who works with it, the Specifically group, right? for with the that reason, group, and I would so. engage them early on. Yes, yeah. absolutely. These are high-risk individuals, and, and part of their high-risk specialty is dealing with patients who've had um, uh, immunosuppressive medications or, or alterations in chronic care. Mm -hmm. yes. um, I had a question about like, genetics and probiotics. Um, mm -hmm. I do give him probiotics, probiotics and he transplanted. Mm -hmm. Antibiotics, yeah. 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 Uh, that was on the slide. It was on the slide, yeah. Though, yeah. We, did, we, I don't think either of us would discourage yeah, I wouldn't it. Yeah, discourage um, either. You know, it, it, when I said dietary choices, some sometimes the recommendation is for particular types of yogurts that can be given, especially to children who don't want to take the probiotics or have the, you know, some of the fallout from that. Um, so that that's another alternative option, but. The, the places I've seen people run into problems are bone marrow transplant patients exactly. where you have graft versus host disease. So, exactly. so breakdown in the lining of the GI tract and then you know you give probiotics and they actually get into the bloodstream. So I think that was a more, uh, sorry, we hadn't um, you know, removed that. But, but it's, it's a, that's a general thing better to ask in each situation. But, but in, in general, I think probiotics can be quite helpful for transplant patients, yeah. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Well, this has been a, a wonderful opportunity for both of us, and, and I hope it's been helpful to you all. Um, refer to the recording. If it's, if it's helpful, please feel free to reach out to either of us if you have further questions. So. Thank you so much for your time.